This is a fascinating machine. What is it? Ah, this is the Atavacron. I'm sure you'll find something here that pleases you. This appears to be an archive or library of some kind. You are listening to the Tricorder Transmissions. You may select from more than 20,000 thousand tapes. And now, here are Jeff and Claire. So welcome to the second episode of the Atavacron series from the Tricorder Transmissions. I'm here with Jeff and I'm Claire, the co-host. Jeff is the other co-host. We're really excited to be here for our second episode. And before we get started, I just wanted to say hello and thank you to everyone who listened to the first episode and gave us some really great feedback. Uh, We were so happy to hear that you were happy to hear us talking about a piece of the action in the kind of interesting and possibly esoteric way that we did. Uh, So I'm glad that you guys enjoyed that. Today, we will be talking about The Ultimate Computer, which is an episode that Jeff selected, and I think for great reason. It's a fantastic episode. I'm sure most of you are familiar with it and remember what it is. Uh, But just in case you're not, and to kind of give our talk a little bit of introduction, I will read One of the press releases, this is actually the NBC press release from 1968, issued about a month before the episode aired in March. Captain Kirk has no choice but to participate in an exercise which replaces him as commanding officer of the Enterprise. Dr. Richard Daystrom has developed the last word in computers, which the fleet command orders installed on the Enterprise, replacing all but 20 of the crew. War games are scheduled with the Enterprise as target and Starfleet, under Commodore Wesley, in pursuit. The computer performs perfectly until a single distraction upsets the responses and it goes berserk. I have to say, I don't think a single distraction, actually. That seems a little inaccurate to me as someone Mm -hmm. who just viewed the episode. But otherwise, I think that really succinctly sums up the plot. And there's actually a second, much shorter uh, TV guide release that I think will be a really nice transition into what you're going to talk about today, Jeff. Uh, The ultimate computer probes the problem of man versus machine. The question is more than academic for Captain Kirk, who's temporarily replaced by a computer. The machine can think and will ensure its own survival at any cost. Hmm. So, Jeff, if you want to, if that uh, is a good launching point for you, feel free to take it away. Okay. So that is a good launching point. And the, the only thing that I would add to that, TV guide synopsis is that we see uh, man versus machine on Star Trek quite often. But this episode, I think, has a little bit of a different spin on the man versus machine storyline. And, and well, you know, I'm going to get into this in a second here. The first thing I want to say, though, is, is this since you said it was my pick, I want to full disclosure here. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite TOS episodes. This kind of was a selfish move for me. And it's also a topic that I'm very, very interested in talking about. So I think the reasons why I like this episode so much are pretty obvious, but um, I'll just throw them out there. I think William Marshall as Daystrom is just spectacular. Uh, the, The tension that builds in the audience as they're seeing what could be the end of their heroes, but not by death as usual, but by obsolescence, which in this case may be a worse fate than death. So it's an entirely different kind of danger for the crew, although near the end, their lives are threatened for a very short span of time. Uh, some really memorable quotes by many of the characters, which are, which are very inspiring. And it's thought-provoking and represents everything that I think they made the original series so great and topical at the time. So I guess I'll launch into my lead-in for our conversation. And this is a, a way that we are going to be tying the real world to the ultimate computer and and talking about what influenced this episode to be written in the way that it was. So uh, in the decades prior to Star Trek, the original series, a a relatively large percentage of private sector employees in the U.S. worked in the manufacturing space. Some uh, some statistics that I found during some of my research put that percentage as high as 44 to 46 percent of the workforce. And in the mid-1950s, a a very steady decline in the number of people working in that sector began. And while the product output remained fairly consistent until the 1970s when manufacturing started to work its way offshore. Now, uh, uh, this isn't intended to be a history lesson or a discussion of statistics, but to restate the point 
in a simpler way, there were less and less people working on the factory floor while the same amount of goods were being produced. So efficiencies were being introduced. So among other things, this would give rise uh, in the workforce to the fear of automation, uh, or in other words, having your job replaced by a machine or a computer in the case of this episode. The term, of course, automation can be interpreted different ways in a historical context. So for our purposes for today, it represents the replacement of the human workforce with machines. Even though the mid-50s seems to be the turning point as far as labor is concerned, there are plenty of other examples of automation far earlier in American history. Probably one of the most popular uh, being back in 1789, and that was Eli Whitney's cotton gin, which reduced the workforce necessary for processing cotton by almost 50%. So another good example, of course, is the first use of the automobile assembly line in 1913. So it also bears mentioning, uh, before I (laughs) come around about here, it also bears mentioning there are several different levels of automation. If you go back and you read American history, especially in this industrial period, there are several levels, one of which, the highest of which, is what's called the closed loop process, which requires no human interaction whatsoever. And I think that actually applies very well to this episode. Uh, The middle of the 60s, closed loops had started to crop up all throughout the American uh, manufacturing industry, which added even more fuel to that fire, that that fear of being replaced. And actually to support that fact, in 1964, McGraw-Hill published a survey indicating that about 65% of manufacturing plants in the U.S. that employed over 100 people were using some form of automation to reduce the necessary workforce. So, um, you know, unemployment rates in the 50s and 60s support that fact. So in a roundabout way uh, of getting back to how our world influenced the ultimate computer, in the episode, a similar situation exists. So 430 previously indispensable crewmen and women in danger of being replaced by a single computer, uh, a machine that could not only do almost all of their jobs, but potentially do them better. In retrospect... Uh, in, in my opinion, this episode could be one of the most well-timed social commentaries in, in the entire original series. So sorry for taking so long to get that point out. No, no, that was fascinating. I'm really glad that you elaborated on that. Something that you mentioned was with the historical anecdotes that you were talking about were all automation happening at a particular class level in terms of the job that was being automated. It's a, a manufacturing, a factory, kind of the the blue collar sort of American factory worker type person being replaced in some part or in all part in these, this automation sort of surge that happened during the fifties and sixties. What's interesting to me is that you have a completely different class of position being automated in the ultimate computer. It's Mm -hmm. a totally different realm of job suddenly becoming obsolete or person becoming obsolete. Exactly. And that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up because there, I have another little uh, bit that I applies directly to what you were just saying. And so during the episode, we see you know, M5 taking over all sorts of various ship functions, uh, you know, maneuvering, controlling the environment, uh, tactical decisions, uh, power allotments, crew assessments, things like that. But something that, that might not jump out immediately when you talk about automation, because obviously I was focusing a lot on the, the factory worker on the floor, but automation in things like data processing includes things like, you know, calibration of machinery, uh, instrument readings, you know, machinery control systems, clerical work, uh, you know, those also reduce the need for workforce. And that, that applies directly to what happens in the ultimate right. computer. So even people who were handing Captain Kirk the little clipboard to sign off on aren't necessary <laughs> anymore. You, one could argue maybe they weren't necessary to begin with in the <laughs> show, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> That's a good point. But, you know, you, you're not going to hand the M5 a, a clipboard right. for it to sign off on. So everything becomes electronically signed mm-hmm. by the M5. So, in fact, I think the M5 even takes over communications. It so does. It yes. acknowledges uh, communications from Wesley acknowledges them back and communicates on behalf of the enterprise So poor Uhura even has nothing to do. Exactly. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting and just in, again, in terms of automation and you mentioned the closed loop automation specifically is the fact that, and maybe I'm jumping ahead in terms of the plot and trajectory of the episode, but at some point the M5 misbehaves and destroys a freighter, an ore freighter that is completely automated. Right. The ore freighter doesn't have anyone, any crew members on board. And 
I thought it was really fascinating that at no point is that discussed as kind of a counterpoint or a counter argument for the M5 automating space exploration, basically. That apparently, you know, it's again, it's it's okay when it's sort of a menial job. It's not okay when it's a really mm. heroic, noble pursuit that's being automated. That's actually an excellent, excellent point. I think there was a there was a McCoy quote earlier on in the episode mm-hmm. where he's talking to Captain Kirk, where I think he almost alludes to something that that overshadows this, and that's you know, it's when somebody else loses their job to a computer, you feel bad for them, but when it's your job. It's something else. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you see, and even Spock said, I believe Spock said something to the effect of that, the Woden, that ship, the the, the mm-hmm. ore freighter was automated a long time ago. I don't remember the exact yes. number, but it was a hundred years. It was a long time ago. It was an old ship. Yeah. Yeah. This is not something new in the Trek universe, but I, I think as we get deeper into the discussion, we'll find out why the M5 is so much different. Than the automation right. that was happening in, because I mean, we've seen automation in the Enterprise prior to this when they have automatic systems that will do things for them. You know, you lay a course in and the ship follows it, right? I mean, the navigate right. they don't have to have a joystick or a steering wheel, so they just program it in and go. So it's right. different when it's human interactive automation versus fully automatic. Right. The, the problem with the M5 is that it has higher brain functions, basically. Oddly enough, it's too human. For its own good. Yeah, I guess Daystrom would argue with you on that well, point. Well, he often oh, would. of course he would. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, ultimately, it's the fact that the computer basically talks back or, or refuses to take orders. It becomes self-aware and essentially becomes, to a certain extent, human. And so what initially begins as a the problem of, of man versus machine becomes man versus, frankly, Richard Daystrom's hubris. Exactly. But I might be, and I might be leaving it. I'm sorry if I am. <laughs> no, no, no. It's okay. I think I, I think the way these these conversations are structured, we're going to be jumping all over the place to illustrate our our different respective points. So it, it's tough to follow along the episode exactly. So we can, if you'd like, we can kind of delve into some of the different aspects of the characters and what roles they play. Oh yeah, that would be great. You know, you you essentially got several different angles looking at the same problem that are represented by different characters in this show. So obviously Captain Kirk represents the working stiff. You know, he's the leader, the foreman who is being made obsolete by the, the supercomputer. So the most valuable person on the ship, the most decorated officer, the brilliant tactician, he is almost completely or even completely erased through the course of this episode and until his heroics are needed at the end to make the final decision to save everybody's life, to prove that the machine is, is not, not all it's cracked up to be. And another angle is Starfleet. Starfleet represents the heartless corporate overlord, right? <laughs> From the very beginning, they treat Kirk in a, in a very stern and matter-of-fact and uncaring way. They're bringing him in specifically to replace him and his crew who are actually ushered off of the ship and held mm-hmm. at the space station. They're not, they're not given shore leave. They're actually taken off the ship and held there. And Kirk is left with a crew of 20. And he has no choice in the matter, where Kirk has had the ultimate decision rights throughout his captainship, from what we've seen of, of his missions up until this point. So he's completely stripped of any of his capabilities. And to add a final jab... Uh, Wesley even says, you've done a great job, Jim. Now all you have to do is sit back and let the machine do the work. But, yeah, each each statement, each jab at Kirk's obsolescence, interestingly enough, comes from another human. At no point does the M5 ever try to say anything like that, which I think is interesting. That is actually very interesting. The M5, although Daystrom, ha- I know we're jumping around again, but we, we know Daystrom implanted his own engrams and the M5 has some of his characteristics, but he is the one that exhibits the hubris. The M5's only interest is doing its job and surviving. It does not want to belittle or prove anybody right or wrong. It just wants to do what it was programmed to do by Daystrom and not be uh, not be shut off. Exactly. Yeah, he has no direct no interest in directly competing with Kirk. He's simply just wanting to continue to exist and operate. I think 
if they were to take the M5, give Kirk another ship and just give the M5 the Enterprise in some sort of strange negotiation tactic, I doubt the M5 would care at all whether or not Kirk got to go on and have a career. He's not interested, or it's not interested at all in removing a person from their job or replacing a person's job. The M5 just wants to have its own job. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great way of looking at it. So the machine itself, it's not there to compete with anyone. Uh, it's not it's not even there to prove itself. I don't even think the M5 is aware that it has to prove itself. It's just saying, well, here I am. I'm switched on. I've got my power source. I've got control of this ship, and I'm going to do what I was designed to do. Daystrom personifies it throughout the entire episode, but only at near the end when Kirk is talking it to death does it actually seem to exhibit uh, consciousness? And what's interesting is, I, I don't know if at any point we're going to talk about HAL 9000 and the fact that this is a really, this episode is a really great kind of point counterpoint for 2001 A Space Odyssey, but the M5, even though it does murder people and it does interpret its orders uh, of, of the mission has to be a success, it, it interprets that as sanctioning to a certain extent or allowing destruct the destruction of other people or other ships so in a lot of ways it does kind of go down that same murderous path that hal 9000 does but at no point do i ever get the impression that the m5 is a psychopath hal 9000 is completely a psychopath yes uh even though it's also following orders and it's also a machine i mean hal 9000 i think is a really frightening character I'm never really a frightened of the M5. I'm fr a frightened of the consequences of its actions, but at no point do I feel like the M5 itself is a threatening persona. I, and, and maybe it's because of the, the fact that it's only an hour long episode. And so the character wasn't fleshed out more, or I don't know. The voice acting is different. You know, the M5 speaks in a very monotone sort of computer voice. And so that might help a lot to not anthropomorphize the M5 the way HAL 9000 is anthropomorphized with a human voice i don't know i think i think the hal 9000 character is written to a further extreme than, uh, than the m5 so the m5 never reaches the point now if the m5 had succeeded in its mission it would have eventually ascended to the point where humans actually trusted it and had relationships with it and that's where hal 9000 was it had the trust of the people. It was, it was almost treated as if it was a member of that mm -hmm. ship's crew, which essentially it was. So it was, right. you know, we as people, and I, I guess I'll, I'll probably a lot of us have in the back of our minds, you know, what, what happens if we let machines go too far? And I think Hal is a great representation of us becoming so reliant on machines and trusting them so much that they're given the capability to completely turn it around on us and, exert a, a a level of uh, of control over us that we are not comfortable with true but to, and to be as as frightening as hal is and the fact that i just called him a psychopath and i think he is one and yeah and note that i'm using the sorts of pronouns that you use for a person not i'm not calling him it no I, and that's not intentional it just sort of came out that way i think that's how rich the character is but again he's following his order i think and this happens with the m5 and with hal at some point, the breakdown is in specific orders or orders that are that can be interpreted multiple ways. So it's almost the fault of the human doing the programming because HAL 9000 is ordered to ensure that the mission is a success. And he realizes that the weak link is are the humans yeah, aboard exactly. the ship because humans are you know fallible, whereas HAL thinks that computers are infallible. And he ends up, I mean, his actions sort of prove that wrong. But He's operating under a very literal and narrowly defined set of orders. But of course, the person who programmed him with those orders didn't think to say, by the way, that doesn't mean you can go ahead and kill the humans aboard because the humans might accidentally steer the ship in the wrong direction, <laughs> you know, or do something else, make a mistake to jeopardize the mission. I, I, wh and why would a programmer think to do that? if they haven't seen 2001 a Space Odyssey. <laughs> well, to the contrary, the M5 was programmed in such a way that it was not to murder or otherwise kill man. And somehow, in its programming and in the fact that it had those human engrams, it was able to justify it to itself that 
in order to survive because maybe there was a they don't really go through the level of ranking of mm -hmm. m5's programming orders like in terminator there it's, yeah. it's popular they they show you the level uh, of programming and like robocop even they have a certain level of programming and directives and right. there's a directive where he can't kill and so we don't know what the ranking of m5 was and i'm assuming by its behavior that survival is at the top of the stack thou yeah. shalt not kill is in there somewhere but not higher than survival so it's able to it's able to excuse its behavior uh, by the fact that it's saving itself what's interesting is that if m5 in 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 his, in his attempt or its attempt to survive the m5 ends up exhibiting such bizarre behavior that it itself becomes a target so <laughs> mm. if the m5 had not gone quite so far in its aggressive actions towards other ships it never would have had a fleet of constellation class starships bearing down on it at the end you know the 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 lexington and the excalibur would not have been coming after it so it, it would actually have been less of a threat and therefore more likely to survive its own survival would not have been threatened it sort of went to a little too far for its own good in terms of the survival directive it's oh yeah its own behavior sealed its fate right that you know what though that we we don't necessarily know for sure that the m5 could not have prevailed in that scenario and i believe that it probably could have oh i think you're probably right that it could have survived that particular encounter but then it would be essentially a rogue ship the, the computer would it it would be it would definitely be drawing negative attention towards itself. The more ships it destroys, the more ships will be sent after it to destroy it. And that is that is technical that's survival in the short term, but not really in the long term. No, but it's it also it it shows a desire, and maybe this this came from the the human engrams that Daystrom implanted into it. It implies that the M five not only is trying to protect itself, but also wants a degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. And control because it knows maybe it knows and and I'm I'm theorizing maybe it knows uh, in its heart of hearts that if it were to succeed in the war games and be an accepted part of the enterprise be permanently installed it would still be subservient to Starfleet it would still have to do what Starfleet mm -hmm. told it to do and you know Daystrom designed it in such a way that it would be forced to use it to be used as Daystrom designed it to be used well and Daystrom himself wanted nothing more than to convince people of the success of his work and so in a way I guess that explains the M5 putting itself in an unsafe situation by becoming a target because at the very least people will know it was successful it's kind of a going out in a blaze of glory sort of I don't think the M5 itself had arrogance or pride or hubris but if it was programmed with daystrom's engrams and we know that he himself was having you know dealing with issues of proving that he was not a fluke that he wasn't a boy wonder that he was a, a serious legitimate scientist who should be taken seriously that could have leaked in also it's very interesting that he chose to use his own engrams on a computer that was designed to captain a starship and not the engrams of a starfleet captain mm -hmm. i think the m5 may have behaved completely differently if they had chosen someone someone who was qualified to actually perform the task as a human you've chosen them uh to donate their engrams or use their engrams the m5 may have been a better decision maker in a in a starfleet setting in that case hmm. that's actually a great point because we've seen that successfully done in once again robocom <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you, they they chose a police officer. They didn't choose like a chef, you know. Exactly, and and in subsequent efforts, they weren't using police officers uh, to build the subsequent RoboCop sequels, and none of them worked. Ooh, there's a lot. That's that's a that's a deep statement to unpack. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of reasons the Robo RoboCop sequels didn't really work. <laughs> yes, well, you know, I, I'm keeping it high level here, Claire. So now. Since we're on the M5 and its success or failure uh, and its level of sentience, I, I thought about this. Since they do have to retain a certain contingent of a human workforce on that ship in order to support the M5, if the M5 were to become somewhat of a rogue ship, it would not be able to function. Would it have to essentially enslave those people who were still on board the ship? Because it would need certain human functions in order to keep the ship itself running 
So it would need engineers yeah. and mechanics, right, to repair things that went bad, you know, the engines, uh, you know, the warp core, things of that nature. You would obviously need some sort of medical staff to treat those people, you know, when they were had fallen ill or were injured. In fact, Spock even says that there are no current computers in this era that can replace uh, the medical staff or a skilled surgeon. Right. I believe he says, which, of course, we know later on they'll have holograms that can do that. But, I mean, you would also need janitors, security guards. Yeah, eventually you end up needing the whole – you need the whole crew back <laughs> because you need someone to cook. You, you're right. You Potentially you need security in case the enslaved crew members have a, a spat <laughs> or, you know, there's a thief on board or something. You end up needing pretty much everyone but the command staff. Although within each unit, you do need someone in charge to coordinate the repair efforts or the whatever it is that the crew is doing. Humans need other humans around to care for them. Even if the computer doesn't really need a whole... It only needs the repair people, for example, the mechanics, the engineers. It doesn't need the chefs or the doctors, but the mechanics and engineers need the chefs and the doctors. Exactly. I don't know why I'm saying a chef. They had replicators, but... It, well, wait a minute. <laughs> sort of. I mean, I know that's a whole nother topic. What is that stuff they're eating? The colored fruit or whatever that is? I don't know. Well, not in every <laughs> episode, though. There there are episodes of Star Trek, the original series, where they actually talk about cooking actual food. That's true. That is so true. So there is a facility on the ship for something like that. That is true. But I'm sure the M5 would consider that non-essential and everybody would eat replicated food. Yeah, those weird colorful cubes but you know since we're talking about the human support staff and you brought up this, the great point that eventually you'd wind up having to add back a large contingent of the crew in order to support the m5 long term i was thinking to myself even if the m5 functioned perfectly i'm not convinced by the evidence that it was presented in this episode that it could have completely replaced kirk in every possible scenario like, how would it have dealt with the truly unpredictable, bizarre stuff that Kirk and company had come across throughout their travels? Like, what would, it, what would the M5 have done if it was flying through space, it, it, it starts to orbit around a planet, and Abraham Lincoln appears in space? What would the M5 <laughs> have done? <laughs> that in itself would have been enough to, to the, you know, convince the M5 to shut itself off. That would have been the same kind of illogic that <laughs> you can argue a computer to death with um actually i think the episode sort of answers maybe not that specific question but that sort of question right at the very beginning mm. when kirk and mccoy are walking out of engineering after they first meet dr daystrom and the m5 and kirk says i've got a bad feeling and he points at the back mm -hmm. of his neck and he's i just feel wrong about this and it's all intuition it's all gut it's exactly what the m5 would never have even bef and even after you find out that it has human engrams, it still doesn't have intuition. And again, and that comes into play at the very end when Kirk chooses to do the illogical thing, which is keeping the shields down in a very dangerous situation mm -hmm. because he feels the intuition of a captain that the captains of the other ships will not fire because they recognize how unusual the scenario is. And that, again, that's something that, and you're right, the M5 would not really be able to replicate. You know, frankly, this sort of thing comes up to leap ahead momentarily to the next generation. When Data gets his temporary command, mm -hmm. he has issues. Well, he doesn't have issues. His second in command has issues with Data and just flat out does not think that an android is fit to, to command a ship. Because, and, and it's not so much an issue of intuition in this case, but... The first officer's arguments are, you know, do you feel anything for your crew? Would, would you order them to their deaths and not even think about it because you're just a machine? And, of course, that guy is being an ass, <laughs> but a very pro-data. But the issue does come up 150 years later, 120 years later. You know, you still have this issue of a non, basically a non-organic being as a commander or a captain. You know, what, how would they deal with those unusual situations or how about a flesh and blood computer acting as a captain in the galileo 7 where spock who uh, yeah. is regarded as an alien 
and a computer yes uh, has the same types of issues that data did he does and you know i have to say both of those episodes get me equally riled up when i watch them because i just want to smack everybody who questions spock or data's ability to command <laughs> it that really pisses me off i'm very protective of those characters but you're right it is exactly the same scenario in both cases they are a the the sort of Unusual commanders or captains are able to prove themselves perfectly capable, but for different reasons. I mean, in Spock's case, he actually does end up using some of that gut intuition that both he claims not to have and that everyone assumes he doesn't have, except for McCoy, who knows it's secretly there. In Data's case, he simply isn't this sort of cold-blooded machine that, you know, orders people to their death, people to their death because he doesn't think about it as being an issue. Data's fine. He doesn't have to do anything particularly amazing. But what he does need to do is gain the trust of his crew because he does give an unusual order at one point and it needs to be carried out immediately for the plan to work. And his crew begins to question him momentarily because they're not sure, is this guy malfunctioning or is this a normal just captain's prerogative situation? If it had been a human or a human, an organic being, I doubt they would have questioned, is this, you know, what should we do here? I think they would have just carried the, the order out. And I think that one commonality that exists between Spock and Data in the same situations was they both exhibited a capacity to to grow and use things that they had learned from other people, maybe maybe their captains even, mm -hmm. to improve Absolutely. their situations. Where the M five did not strive to do anything of the sort. In fact, it, it it strove to be more independent and and act on its own rather than trying to emulate. Uh, the better human qualities that Dr. Daystrom might have had. Well, yeah, there was zero compromise in M5's actions. And I think if we've learned anything from Star Trek, it's that captains cannot be author completely authoritarian figures to be mm -hmm. and, and be successful Starfleet captains. And the M5 was totally authoritarian in its own sort of way. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't being authoritarian in an emotional sense, but it was just flat out shutting off parts of the ship without consulting anyone didn't, you know, it, it seems like McCoy who ends up on the bridge for most of the episode because sick bay doesn't have any power. I would assume that McCoy asked the M5, Hey, can you turn the lights and the, you know, life support back on? Cause this is my office. And the M5 apparently just refused. There's no compromise. There's no stating your side of the case to the M5. Right. It does what it feels necessary based on circumstances, the most efficient possible solution. So I would surmise that it would only re-enable the power in sickbay if someone was actually sick or injured. Which is what McCoy says, kind of, you know, tongue in cheek. But I think you're right that that would really be what happens. Hmm. There's no there's no creativity in terms of the M5's command decisions. It simply finds the most efficient route from point A to point B or the most efficient way to well, I mean, frankly, I think that's why it destroys that freighter. It's more efficient to shoot something first, <laughs> even if it's not a threat. I mean, it's a it's a purely efficient move. I guess the energy expenditure of firing the weapon or the photon torpedoes or spending that ammunition was not outweighed by the uh, the result. I guess not. Yeah. And I mean, a single shot on an unsuspecting target, you probably only have to fire once because you can get the perfect shot the first time. You don't have to worry about you know, the shields out on the other ship haven't gone up. They're not maneuvering around. True, but photon torpedoes are a finite resource. That is true. but And so is that ore on that freighter. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't very good ore, maybe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or wasn't useful to the M5 in any way. I wonder if that freighter was of use to the M5 if it would have captured it instead. Oh, that's a very interesting thought. I, hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I don't think Spock says what type of ore is on board. I, I wonder if it was carrying dilithium crystals, if M5 would have put the tractor beam on and pulled it in. That's interesting. I don't know. I mean, hmm. you never see it stop. So a couple of times the Lexington or the Excalibur are uh, sort of adrift. They're you know, defeated, I guess, for lack of a better term, early on in the uh, the War Games exercises. And you don't see the Enterprise sort of veering back to collect the spoils or anything like that. But it's also got another ship to deal with, so that might be why. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that that could that could serve as a, a whole other deeper conversation. In fact, I think we should extend the invitation to our listeners to join us on social media and discuss some of these these lingering questions that we're coming up with. Yeah, I mean, if the M5 were able to 
successfully complete control of the enterprise. There aren't any people on board. It's got its enslaved crew, whatever the explanation is for that. In other words, it's it's out doing its own thing. It's becoming sentient. Would it begin to capture and accumulate the materials it would need to build another one of itself? Would it become reproducing? That's a good question. Now, th- of course, that that begs the question as well. Would it eventually? I'm sure it would have to force the humans who were on the ship to do this before it could automate it. But would it force the the humans to build uh, robots in order to replace themselves? I would think so. Yeah. If you're just trying to be purely efficient, you get, you know, your bare minimum crew to take care of the day-to-day engineering tasks. Then you get a couple of extra people to work on building robots or androids or some something so that you no longer need the people. And then it becomes self-perpetuating. And yes. evolves into the Borg. Yeah, pretty much. M5 is the, oh. the birthplace of the Borg. Look where we went there. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Now, what would have happened? Would, what would have happened if the M5 were allowed to go off on its own and, and create its own race? Maybe the M5 is the computer race that V'ger ends up uh, oh. in, encountering. Yeah, you know, right. we don't know what they did with the M5 after... They went they back. They, I mean, obviously, was it was it put into a box and and put into a giant warehouse? Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah, the same one that's got the Ark of the Covenant in it. Definitely. Yes. Or did yeah. they did they continue to try to work with it? Because I, I would I would think that Starfleet would probably want to shelve it. But you know, we've seen many nefarious, uh, ulterior motive driven people in Starfleet who may have tried to commandeer that machine. You know, I I, susp- I don't know about the M1 itself, but the fact that Dr. Daystrom ended up getting what seems to me to be the most prestigious engineering institute in all of Starfleet or all of the Federation, maybe even, you know, named after him means that he did not end up living under the cl- this sort of he was not ostracized for the fact that the M5 did murder some people. So obviously he was, you know, his his name, he wasn't snubbed by the future or his his future. I'm sure he was rehabilitated, and I, I wouldn't doubt that the incident was covered up. Oh, I never even thought about it as a cover up. Oh, yeah. Like, why would Starfleet yes. advertise that? Oh, yeah. See, oh, I was thinking all touchy feely, nice, like they gave him a pat on the back and realized that he meant well. And but yeah, some people died. That sucked. I see. Now I was thinking it was like this really nice kind of gesture that he was still able to be appreciated and lauded for the his genius work, despite the fact that he did have one major snag in his career being the M5. But yeah, maybe they just covered it all up. Yeah, they co- they completely covered it up. They took Daystrom and stuck him in the dagger of the mind machine <laughs> and patched him back up. And there he was. Good as oh, new. Wow. That's so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Because no, no, it's okay. It's just the 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 existence of the Daystrom Institute in Next Generation and Beyond is one of my favorite pieces of really subtle Star Trek universe continuity. Yes, ties everything together nicely. Yeah, and they can just sort of name drop the Daystrom Institute. They never remind you who Dr. Daystrom was. If you don't know who he was, you're not in the dark. You understand that it's a research institute or a university. You get it. But if you know what who he is, it's this really wonderful little piece of of reference and continuity that i love but now you've just ruined it for me <laughs> sorry it's not like getting no, beat over the head with zephram cochran right <laughs> that's true not not until first contact came out actually they never mentioned milla cochran's or anything like that until first contact they never really mentioned him again so wrapping back around yes <laughs> as we so often go off on tangents and uh, we got some really great feedback from listeners about some of the cool tangents we went on last time so Hopefully these tangents will be uh, as as fun to listen to as the previous ones. But uh, I, I wanted to take a look at some of the quotations that some of the main characters in this episode say, because I think some of them are very, very telling about the writer's perspective on the automation that was going on. And, and, and I think it lends itself very well to the social commentary. And I, I will defer to you for the big uh, Daystrom quote. But Oh, thank you. There are a couple that were uh, put out there by McCoy, which I thought were really great. And I think you alluded to one before, uh, and one of them is is compassion. That's the one thing no machine ever had. Maybe it's the one thing that keeps men ahead of them. 
And funny, mm-hmm. data will actually have compassion in, in the next generation. So machines do gain the, the ability to have compassion. But I think that really sets McCoy up as a, a support role for for Kirk, who I guess is the focal point of the automation in this episode. So we don't really hear a lot about other people losing their jobs. And in fact, McCoy and Scotty and Spock are not in danger of losing their jobs, and they are by far the most vocally supportive of Kirk. That's very true. That's, you know, I hadn't thought about it that way. That's very true. Hmm. And of course, the other McCoy quote was the one I alluded to. I think I even read most of this before, but this is right after they leave the M5 and uh, Daystrom in engineering the first time. And Kirk is even questioning his own sanity and and asks McCoy about, uh, you You have my psychological records. Am I Am I nuts here? And McCoy tells him, you know, we're all sorry for the other guy when he loses his job to a machine. But when it comes to your job, that's different. And it will always be different. Well, and there's a there's another quote in that same conversation that comes from McCoy that I think is really telling, too. And it's Hmm. McCoy says, you know, Kirk, if you have to ask yourself that question, which is, am I petty? Is there something wrong with me for feeling uneasy about this? McCoy says, if you have to ask yourself that question, then you're fine. And I think that's. Very telling in that a computer would never ask itself that question. You know, again, there's this sort of check of self-awareness that and that a human would have, according to this, you know, in this uh, uh, the way this episode plays out. A human should have this check of self-awareness to essentially think before it acts and question its own actions before acting on them that a computer doesn't have. And in some respects, we start to see that Dr. Daystrom didn't necessarily have those same checks either because of his intense desire to prove to his colleagues that he is a very capable man, he sort of acts without thinking about it. He, he, he really should have second guessed the wisdom of putting his own memory engrams in his computer, but he obviously didn't, or maybe he did and just decided to do it anyway. Oh, great, great point. I think that that also calls back to uh, Spock and data having that ability to question themselves and grow. So that, shows that you know Kirk of course does that all the time so we see that that's a that's a, a quality that a, a good starship captain absolutely must have mm-hmm. the ability to question their actions uh, base their uh, base their thinking on uh, things that happened in the past take into account your experiences use your intuition your gut use your knowledge of other people I mean these are all things that the computer may not ever be able to do and it should, certainly the m5 was unable to do in this episode, which allowed Kirk, of course, to prevail uh, in the end. So a couple of, of quick Spock quotes as well, because this these quotes kind of set up Spock's role in this. And Spock is not completely against the M5 as McCoy and Scotty openly are. Uh, Spock approaches it, of course, from the typical Spock interested angle. But there are a couple of things that he says in this episode that kind of give you the hint that he's leaning a certain way but he's riding a line much more uh, much more obviously than than the other characters are so uh, one that i liked was uh, i simply maintain that computers are more efficient than human beings not better even though he constantly criticizes human beings but this is spock's logical side uh, while still supporting the working man so it's logical of course to have the computers around to do some of the work But the ship still requires that human element. And, uh, of course, you know, computers make excellent and efficient servants, but I have no wish to serve under one. This is one of um, one of the one of the best quotes, I think, of the entire episode. Mm -hmm. And Captain, the starship also runs on loyalty to one man and nothing can replace it or him. And, of course, the way Nimoy delivers that line completely destroys the way I just delivered that same line. (laughs) It, it the the emotion in that one brief moment showing uh, how much he supports Kirk is is one of the most endearing Spock moments for me in almost the entire series. But I completely agree. It's an incredibly warm statement, but Spock or Leonard Nimoy, I should say, you know, manages to remain Spock while still being very emotional in his delivery. But it's not an it's not a human type of emotion, but it's an extremely warm, almost loving statement to make uh, you know a platonic love it ties spock's character back to the workers who were whose jobs were safe but still felt a lot of compassion and and support for their comrades who were losing their jobs or in the process of losing their jobs and trying to be as supportive as possible 
of their of their colleagues and you know, I, I think that they're all set up in slightly different ways. Yeah. And in a way, you know, this just occurred to me, I hadn't thought about it until you just sort of all these quotes together are really helpful and sort of made me think of it this way. Maybe it's almost worse to be the guy who gets to keep your job because you have to work under this machine. To be the guy who is rendered obsolete means you can then go and do something else with your life. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you have something fulfilling that you can do with your life you have some interest or hobby or skill so perhaps given the two options it's almost better to be the guy rendered obsolete and of course this being the star trek future presumably no one's going to become homeless as a result of losing their job it's not you know they're not going to lose their home and you know it's it's not quite the same issue as you know the 1950s and 60s uh, if you were, if your job was replaced by automation, you may then no longer have a job or be able to get a future job, which would be a, a serious issue. You know, in the Starfleet future, no longer getting to be a Starfleet captain means you get to go off and pursue whatever your other interests are, in a, which is fun, as opposed to scrambling to make your rent. Horseback <laughs> riding. You, right, yeah. So yeah, cooking in the case eggs. Of, oh, God. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Having a stable in the upstairs of your, your house for some reason, <laughs> because it's the nexus. But you know what I mean? It, it would be a forced change of career. And we all know that if there's one thing that Kirk has to be and is most comfortable being, it's a captain. So it would be tragic if he was no longer a captain, but it would mean that he could potentially go pursue something better as opposed to being essentially enslaved by a computer. True. He could pursue being an admiral. And and hate it. Yeah. And hate it, but he could also have an ulterior motive. He could work his way up the chain until he had enough power to remove the M5 computer and its ilk and get back his captaincy. Which is... Okay, you know, really the only problem with the M5 is that they didn't put an override switch in that thing. I mean, I know they kind of they kind of did and then they couldn't get close to it and all that, but if you look at the computer in on the Enterprise D, it is far more automated mm-hmm. and seems to handle far more functions than the original series Enterprise computer does. I mean, when the Enterprise D sp- does the saucer separation maneuver there are like five people well maybe there's more than five people but there are very few people in the drive section of the enterprise everybody is in the saucer section there's some guys on the battle bridge i guess there's probably some people still in engineering there's like skeleton crew but the ship is still able to function i mean the enterprise d computer does so many of the things that were threatening about the m5 doing but it doesn't take, I mean, it it doesn't backsass the captain when the captain gives it an order, or it's not supposed to anyway. So it seems like they were able between the M5 and the Enterprise D computer to figure out how to give a computer an enormous amount of control without having the computer ever be self-aware enough to want to second guess the person giving it orders. So is it the human engrams that you think are the issue? Here? Yeah. Yeah, maybe so. Or they they got more sophisticated in their programming. And the only time the Enterprise D computer starts to backsass the captain that I can think of off the top of my head is when Barkley integrates himself with the Enterprise D computer. And it's actually Barkley who's telling the captain no and taking over the ship via the computer. So again, we've got a human involved. So it's not the computer's fault. No, it's those darn human engrams. We got we've got to get them out of there. What if they were hot swappable? <laughs> <laughs> swappable engrams yeah you could be like i don't like this one I could, this guy's engrams are kind of annoying let's let's see what else do we have it's like you've got a library of them and you just kind of pick somebody new swap in baylock start getting some aliens in there yeah swap in trelane oh that would be miserable you'd never get the computer back are you kidding me or the enterprise the m5 would be like a saint compared to that he'd he'd take over everything immediately Exactly. And he start playing the piano and wearing garish clothing. <laughs> the M5 would be wearing a sparkly jacket. Now that I could go for. That would be pretty great. <laughs> so getting back to Daystrom, I, there are so many things we could talk about. Daystrom's story arc in this episode, it's a, a wide gamut of, of emotion here. Uh, and, you know, he, he begins in one way and then descends pretty pretty horribly into i guess almost complete insanity and nervous breakdown at the end but not necessarily uh, the the character or the performance but 
what what does the arc of Daystrom's character in this episode say about the writer's opinions of the engineers and scientists who created the machines that would replace human workers in the real world? Were, were usually you would think that the, uh, the the corporate overlords who chose to implement the machines were the evil people, but was there a sentiment also towards the people who were creating the machines that they had a hand in this somehow? Although, if you ask Daystrom, of course, his his intentions were completely noble, and I'm sure that in the real world the engineers and scientists who were creating the computers and the robots and the automation that replaced people also had some noble means for doing so. Making Daystrom go crazy, that was an obvious choice uh, by the writer, making him uh, allow the M5 to destroy things, you know, because of his own hubris. Uh, You know, what does that say, in essence, about what the writer thinks? That's an interesting question. You know, I would never describe Richard Daystrom evil. I don't think no. anything he did was intended. I mean, and, and he clearly shows regret once he finally comes to realize that he's responsible as well as the M5 for the lives that were taken by the mm-hmm. M5. You know, he, he seems extremely regretful. I mean, it's it's a sad and nervous breakdown as opposed to a crazy manic one. I, I So this episode was written by D.C. Fontana, which should surprise nobody because every episode she writes was amazing. And I, I don't know anything about her personal opinions about technology or, you know, I, I don't know. But while watching that episode, and I think it's time to finally pull out that quote that we've been dancing around this whole time, if you'd like. Sure. So the quote that Richard Daystrom gives, it's while he's talking to McCoy and sort of defending the M5. It's the first time that the M5 really acts out. It's, um, I believe it's right after the M5 uses a force field to prevent Kirk from coming over and turning it off. And so that's kind of when everyone realizes like, oh, this thing is taking over. And Richard Daystrom defends the M5 and defends his life's work basically by saying, man no longer need die in space or on some alien world. Man can live and go on and achieve better things than fact-finding or dying for galactic space, which is neither ours to give nor to take. And so this episode was released in March of 1968, which was before the first manned Apollo launch that ended up, that took place in October of 1968. That was Apollo 7. So one of the things, and this might be a surprise, Prize to some people, one of the major areas of contention with the early space program was whether or not we really needed people to do the exploring at all, whether or not we could simply use robotic probes um, much more efficiently and effectively and obviously more uh, safely because they're probes. And so there was a surprising amount of pushback in the scientific community against the concept of manned space exploration. They felt like it was diverting money and attention away from where the real science could be done. And that was, again, through robotics and satellites. Obviously, the opinions shifted uh, the closer we got to the end of the 1960s. And once there were actually astronauts on the moon able to do sample collection, uh, many scientists who previously were skeptical of the value of having test pilots go do science in space Many of them came around to realize that no matter how sophisticated the robot is, they can't make a judgment call that a human being can, even if that human being is not actually a scientist themselves. So backing up a little bit, I I easily have seen Richard Daystrom standing with the scientists in the early to mid-1960s who thought that manned space exploration was actually the wrong way to go about space exploration and, and acquiring knowledge, which I thought... I don't know that that interests me so much because number one, I having hindsight think they were wrong. Uh, obviously, astronauts are great, but at the same time, you know, Richard Daystrom is standing on a spaceship full of astronauts while saying this, and so and much of his career was built on the technology that came before, which required you know human intervention and human space exploration. And so, mm-hmm. I don't know. I just thought there was kind of an interesting. I wouldn't say a disconnect, but I don't know. I'm rambling. No, I think you're you, the, the quote itself, I think in the context of the episode and and from a from a social commentary standpoint, I think almost serves to defend the scientists and the engineers who created the machines that replaced the factory workers in in our own world. 
I think that, um, y- you know, it's, it's easy to look at Daystrom in this episode and, and, and all of the immoral things he allows his machine to do in, in order to strive for success. But I, I think this quote is the, the smoking gun, if you will, that his intentions were completely noble, despite how he's acting today. Yes. You know, I think DC Fontana may not have wanted him to be perceived solely as or completely as a villain, or, or but, uh, you know, have more of the focus be on the M5 and, and have Daystrom at least partially redeemable in this. I agree. And I think that Daystrom's mm-hmm. quote is also really important because it prevents this episode from becoming simple technological fear-mongering. This is exactly. not an anti-science or an anti-technology episode. And I think without a really strong character in Dr. Daystrom, I think it could have been perceived as one, which I think would have been totally antithetical to Star Trek anyway. And and frankly, wouldn't I think it would have been a much less meaningful episode if it had simply been fear-mongering of, you know, look how scary this new technology stuff can be. It's not it doesn't get anyone thinking. It's not a conversation starter when you just run, run around frightened the thing that you're frightened of. It's it's very different. Uh, like I said, it, it, during the beginning of this episode, we talked a lot about man versus machine, and and I, I said that I thought this episode was a bit different than man mm-hmm. versus machine. And if you look at some of the other examples in the original series alone of man versus machine, take you know the changeling for example. Nomad was far more of a of an immediate and menacing threat to the crew than the M5 was, and and other computers mm-hmm. like uh, Landru, yeah, a, a lot more of a threat than than the M5 was. The M5 wasn't really a direct threat to the crew; it was just doing what it was programmed to do. So it's a a bit of a different way of looking at the machine. I, yeah, I think ultimately it's more about how humanity uses the technology or or um, put safeguards or limitations on the technology. So again, the M5 itself didn't do anything it wasn't programmed to do. The problem was with the programming. And the programming was done by a human, or in this case, was actually human engrams. So again, it's about the power of technology. And if you, u- if you misuse it, there can be terrible results. But if you use it correctly, then you can be on a spaceship running around exploring the universe because... Obviously, there's technology. Uh, the Enterprise is, you know, the pinnacle of technology, and it's clearly a wonderful thing. Uh, and is is the reason that Captain Kirk gets to be relevant and gets to be Captain Kirk. I think it's really interesting that at some point Captain Kirk starts reminiscing for a version of captaincy, a version of sort of the masculine relevancy that has not been around for centuries. And he starts talking about being on a tall ship and, you know, the water and the waves. And he acknowledges the fact that, you know, there's no water and waves out here in space, but that the idea is the same, that you're a captain and you have this relationship with your ship. But I thought it was kind of interesting that he he immediately begins reminiscing for something that, frankly, I don't think as a person he's ever really experienced. I mean, I doubt that he ever has captained a tall ship, you know, maybe like on a weekend out somewhere uh, during his academy days i don't know i mean he he immediately pines for this this nostalgia that sort of doesn't make sense which is something that you frequently see people doing who are confronted by technology that makes them uncomfortable they immediately knee jerk back hmm. to the old fashioned way of doing things but they usually go back three or four generations before their own time and end up pining for something that actually was quite inconvenient or that they wouldn't even know how to use anyway if they were confronted with it today because it's completely outdated, which is sort of interesting to me. Um, he didn't simply say, wouldn't it be great if the M5 you know, had an off switch and we could access it? He's gone all, all the way back to you know, the rigging of a sailing vessel. Hmm. Well, the end of the episode itself actually lends itself to the same type of reminiscing in a way because it it implies you know that kirk being able to use his cognitive skill to outwit and and ultimately disable the computer is like a ray of hope right that and and it's it's almost a way to say okay you know working stiffs you know the computers are not as useful as everybody wants you to believe they are and if we just go back to the way things were and, and, you know, we go back to work and the computers go away, that everything will be fine again. But, and what, but what's interesting is that you're, you have that message being spoken by a vehicle 
or by by a, a, sh- a TV show that's all about a very technologically advanced future. <laughs> and so <laughs> obviously at some point between the factory worker in 1958 who might get his job back if he just kind of throws their sabo and Yeah, the exactly. Um, <laughs> if they wait, obviously technology continues to progress between that guy wanting his job back in the 50s and you know Kirk sitting in the bridge of the enterprise so it's it's kind of an interesting it's like technology can progress but it's got to progress in a way that we're comfortable with it's not the technology that we have a problem with it's the loss of control mhm well well said and you know i think that that is a, a very good parallel to the end of the story here because the resolution of the story from a a, a real world perspective heavily favors the average joe Mm -hmm. And humans retaining control and continuing to use machines in the way that they have in the Star Trek universe up until this point, right? They were comfortable with the level of automation they had because they always did have that off switch. They always did have the way to program it to do what they wanted when they wanted. And by the virtue of M5's evil deeds or, you know, morally evil deeds by human standards, you know, I think it's implied that uh, in this context that technology is in fact fallible and shouldn't be completely trusted to run on its own. And, mm-hmm. you know, we're meant to believe, I guess from this, that we should default to the, the, the tried and true ways of doing things and humans uh, should be in control with technology being subservient or, you know, electronic slaves, as you will. Fortunately, Data did win his independence, though. He did, yes, <laughs> definitely. Well, and and to um, hark back to or or call out nth degree the tech next generation episode one more time, where Barkley essentially becomes the computer because he becomes extremely intelligent. He's the quintessential average Joe. He is the most average Joe of all Starfleet personnel ever. I mean, he's such a regular guy. He's socially awkward and goofy, and I I love him. But he is a completely normal person. He's like an audience member plopped into the middle of Starfleet. He's he's like a regular dude. And it's, I think, part of what's so alarming about that episode, it's a fantastic episode, is you take this totally average guy and you tweak his IQ so that's up around the 2000 level. I think that's what it ends up being. And he immediately becomes power hungry. But again, it's not evil. It's just everybody else around him is so far beneath him that he can't really consider their needs. It's just, it's just, they're so inconsequential. They become irrelevant, not because he starts taking over the ship's functions in a way that means they don't need to do their jobs. They become irrelevant because they are intellectually irrelevant to him. They're insects, basically. And I don't know, I think it's it's sort of an interesting little parallel where you have a computer that doesn't intend to take over Kirk's role, unintentionally taking over Kirk's role. And then you have someone else who completely intends to take things over because it's just too slow for him. And he's he, he's inconvenienced by having to deal with regular people at the point that when, once he becomes super intelligent, uh, Barkley. I don't know. I just think there's a, an interesting little little foil going on there um well, we've seen that trait exhibited by many aliens also in in, yes. in many star trek episodes the all-powerful aliens who are so far above uh you know the the uh, enterprise crew that finds them that they immediately start to treat the enterprise people as slaves or or servants of, of a certain nature i mean think of episodes like plato's stepchildren uh the apollo episode <laughs> Oh, who mourns for Adonis? Who mourns for Adonis? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you're you're at a point where you're so powerful that you just don't think of lesser beings in the same way anymore. And in both cases, they get bored. Right. You know, I mean, Adonis is the last, or Apollo, is the last of his kind. The rest of the pantheon has sort of dissipated into thin air at some point out of sheer boredom and irrelevancy mm. and for whatever reason, he stuck behind. Well, he wanted to. He wanted to go back to the old ways. That's true. Just yeah. like Kirk and Spock and McCoy <laughs> wanted to go back to the old ways and disable the M five. <sighs> it's a cycle. It is. You know, speaking of disabling the M five, it's interesting that apparently the death penalty still exists for oh, murder. I was going to bring that up. Oh, sorry. That up. No, no, it's fine. I'm glad you brought that up. And the M5 knows it. It does. And I thought visiting Talos 4 was the only punishable by death offense in uh, nope. Starfleet. 
but I guess also murder. Well, I, I, maybe that's the only death sentence that Starfleet itself will would carry out on you mm. visiting Talos for, but, but a, a murder probably goes to a regular criminal court. Or maybe it's just, oh, okay, wait a minute. Maybe it, that's not actually the legal consequence of death, or excuse me, of murder. Maybe because Kirk read Dr. Daystrom's psychological profile, maybe he uh, knows that that is an opinion that Dr. Daystrom holds, whether, uh, moral you know, that opinion. Is, uh, yeah, exactly. So it's a moral thing. Oh, that excellent. He thinks Dr. Daystrom thinks murder is so terrible that Kirk can take a gamble and assume that death would be the answer to his question. You know, what is the consequence of murder? Yeah, that's a good point mm-hmm. because Kirk's Kirk's aim in, in that conversation is to convince the machine to either relinquish control or shut itself off. Right. And of course, we know that he uses his knowledge of Commodore Wesley in order to win in the end. So maybe he is using his knowledge of Daystrom in order to win against the computer. That's a great point. Right. Which again, is that sort of lateral thinking that a computer would not necessarily be capable of. True. Unless Dr. Soon created it. That is so true. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I say computer, I don't mean data or lore or any of the Soongian androids. (laughs) We have to make sure that they're excluded. Well, we keep having, I mean, shoot, our earlier conversation, we kept having to stumble around and find the word organic being because you can't say human because, well, technically, what about a Ferengi? Okay, well, you know what I mean? <laughs> Non-robotic humanoid. Absolutely. So, Claire, this has been a great discussion. Do you have any other uh, unchecked off boxes on your, your notepad yet? Um, Let's see. You know, no, I think I think I really got to all of them. Oh, just for one little mini moment, we can tie this into a literary theme. Sure. You can spend literally just this next sentence on it if you'd like. But there's a real Frankenstein, Frankenstein's monster thing going on with Dr. Daystrom and Good his point. creation. Um, when Especially when he starts referring to the M5 as his child or saying that it misunderstood. It's mm-hmm. very, he's makes the sorts of excuses for it that he you would a child or a some some other living being that you're responsible for and he's not making excuses about his own ability to create a computer his, his the excuses have nothing to do with himself or his own skills as a scientist they have to do with defending the the result of his his efforts an excellent literary reference and i did not pick Thank up you. on that there we got one in there you go <laughs> you get one into every episode somehow awesome but very well done. I, I, I had some – that was great because I did have some notes about how uh, Daystrom had personified the M5. In fact, at one point, I think he says he, he had considered it perfected despite the fact yes. that it clearly was not by definition perfected. But in his own opinion, maybe it was because perfection is subjective. That's true. And a parent – you know, I mean he really is a parent to this thing. And most parents are willing to overlook things in their children that someone else – does not overlook because it's not their child. And in a way, I guess maybe it was related to him in the fact that it has his engrams inside of it. So That's it was an true. extension of him. Yes. So, as creepy as that is. And you know, you that wonder why, I guess maybe you can consider uh, the, the whole engram in a computer issue dead because they. you would think that, that soon didn't need to do it for these really advanced androids, you know, in next gen, right? Mm-hmm. So... Maybe the maybe the the M five proved beyond a doubt that uh, implanting the human engrams in a computer was just not the way to create a, a sentient machine. Well, they so I think you yeah maybe so when you're talking about creating a sentient machine from scratch that that has its own sentience. Mm-hmm. But uh, there is a next generation episode where a really creepy old guy basically steals data and oh i've seen that one, and yes. it plants his own consciousness into data and then data becomes a dirty old man basically mm-hmm. yeah and starts leering at the old man's young assistant and yes. it's it's a great a great great opportunity for brent spiner to do some really creepy uncomfortable acting yes, he's flexing a little bit flexing his oh muscles. yeah yeah it's just oof. it's good bad it was good. creepy though it is super creepy um so that so the, technically the transfer works, but obviously it doesn't, you know, it's not a successful thing um, in the long run and it doesn't remain permanent, obviously. Thus reinforcing um, the fact that the, the engrams in the android or the machine may not be the best idea. 
exactly. unless you're RoboCop. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It might be technically achievable, but you probably should not do it anyway. Yeah. Not the best idea in the world. So I think that was about it for me too. You want to, you want to wrap things up? I just want to say thank you, Jeff, for choosing such a great episode. Um, I oh. think this is one of those, uh, that I, I will rewatch it a couple of times in preparation for this podcast. And one of the things that occurred to me uh, the first time that I rewatched it was how fantastically relevant it still is as mm-hmm. an episode and and what a great example it is of science fiction in general being able to kind of reflect uh cultural preoccupations or fears with a certain thing crystallize those issues in the wonderful little science fiction lens you know you see that with monster movies in the 1940s and 50s as a fear about radiation and mm-hmm. nuclear and atomic energy in the 70s you have the crazy weather m- disaster movies yeah. um, you know i'm like each each uh, decade kind of has its thing sharknados <laughs> yeah uh, but i think the ultimate computer is surprisingly it's still extremely relevant and would make an excellent episode to show someone who does not watch star trek who's maybe not interested or doesn't understand why people are interested in watching a show from the 1960s still you know, that's a great point, Claire, because usually you, you default to an episode like City on the Edge of Forever. And that's a good one, too. I Don't get me wrong. But, sure. But I think The Ultimate Computer is, you know, number one, it's a bottle show. So mm-hmm. it's entirely contained within sort of the established, the Enterprise. It's, it's that Star Trek thing that I think people would expect. There's no guy in a rubber suit. No nope. offense to guys in rubber suits. <laughs> There's no monster of the week, really. Um, nope. So it doesn't have sort of the things that Trekkies love, but that people who maybe aren't into Star Trek would be put off by or laugh at. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, I think it would be a really great uh, gateway episode to maybe maybe not necessarily to get someone interested in Star Trek on a permanent basis, but at the very least to explain why we can still talk about Star Trek 50 years later. Yes, I I, sums it up perfectly. And if I find anybody who has not seen Star Trek and I want to show them an episode, I may start out with the ultimate computer from now on. Oh, well, if you do, I'd love to know how they how they take it, what they think of it. I am sure that I, you will be the first person I send a message to. Thank you. When I find <laughs> out. And, you know, thank you, Claire, for for driving this episode. It was a lot of fun to talk about these things. And before we close out, I know you hate being put on the spot, but I'm mm-hmm. going to put you on the spot anyway. OK, I want to really quickly I want to read off a couple of these really glowing reviews of our last episode. And I I want to preface this by saying that the feedback predominantly highlights what a wonderful job Claire has done and what a great addition to the show she is. I know she gets embarrassed by being put on the spot, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm only going to read a couple of them, so don't worry. Okay. The first one reads, Claire, you are a welcome addition to the Tricorder crew. You really class the join up. Thanks for bringing your fresh perspective and battery of knowledge to the discussion and pushing out the boundaries of an already entertaining podcast. Very nice. There's a little bit in here about me, but I'll read it. Yeah, you should. Uh, Jeff, as always, great job in finding new ways to spin the endless discussion of our Star Trek universe. Love the concept of the new theory of series. Looking forward to discovering more reasons why I like the show. So, Claire, excellent. <laughs> well, thank yes, thank you to the person who wrote that. Yes, that <laughs> was a Facebook kind. comment. Really enjoyed the first episode, Jeff and Claire. It's another Facebook comment. Like Jeff, I too found the Norse history lesson very interesting. So there's a little side note. Worried, Claire was worried about uh, the, the running off track and, and not being interesting, but I think that's confirmation. That, uh, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> it's one of the great things that you can bring to this show. And... Uh, I'll I'll stop after this one, and this one was sent to me directly. Uh, I really like the new Friday podcast. I could probably listen to Claire all day. I think there's a sophistication coming out of this podcast that you don't often find on this type of subject, maybe in writing, but not in a podcast. So that's some really lovely lovely feedback, and uh, Claire, I think uh, you you should be proud. Well, thank you. I will. I'll revel in my own quiet way. I'm blushing right now genuinely so (laughs) thank you to everyone who listened and and wrote and enjoyed what we had to talk about and i hope you enjoyed this episode as well yes i i think they will i think this was a very excellent discussion and before we close up we'll we'll let the audience know where they can find us if they want to talk to us because i know we did issue an audience challenge so if you would like to speak to us directly 
you can tweet us at ttt underscore pod or i am on twitter at j underscore b-e-n-j that's j underscore binge and, and claire where are you I'm on Twitter, and my handle is Isolinear Chick. That's I S O L I N E A R C H I C K. Yes. Wonderful. So please, and you can also find us on Facebook, although Claire is not on Facebook. We are on Facebook at the Tricorder Transmissions. <laughs> so anything that you post there, I will repost over on Twitter so that Claire can. Uh, and also jump in on the conversation. So Thank you. I'm going to be one of those technological Luddites that we just got through talking about and say that I will never join Facebook. <laughs> well, Claire does not want Facebook to, to go rogue and take over her entire life. So it's, exactly. uh, I think that's a completely founded. Uh, <laughs> just watch out for Google, Claire. Just watch out for Google. Yeah. Um, all right. So I guess that, that about wraps it up. And uh, thanks again for everybody for listening. Thanks for being here, Claire, and doing such a great job facilitating. Thank you. It's been fun. All right. And we will see you all two Fridays from now. Yes. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.